welcome the House Education Committee and the Vermont House of Representatives on uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, April 7th. And we are here right now listening to Sharon Academy and some of the challenges that they're facing. And so I want to welcome Head of School Mary Newman. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Mary Newman. I'm the head of school of the Sharon Academy, and I'm here with my colleague, Andrew Lane, who is the director of the middle school, who's here to answer any questions that come up that he might be better positioned to answer than I am. Uh, the Sharon Academy is a small independent school in Sharon, Vermont, serving about 160 students in grades seven through 12 from as many as 14 different towns. 85% of our students are publicly funded. <clears throat> The problem that we face is that we are required to set our tuition no higher than the Vermont average announced tuition or AAT, but the AAT is not representative of secondary spending in Vermont. In other words, it does not cover the cost of educating our kids. Because the AAT provides inadequate funding, we have to raise about $275,000 in an annual appeal and charge each student an annual fee, which for next year, we think will be about $650 for middle school students and $750 for high school students in order for us to meet our operating budget. This fee is really a tuition surcharge and families are having a harder and harder time paying it. Many families in our community are not able to contribute on top of that fee to the annual fund. So again, to meet our operating budget, we have to charge a fee for every student that more and more families are struggling to pay. And then on top of that, we have to raise $275,000 in donations. So we've been thinking about how to solve this problem, <clears throat> which has been growing for years. And one path we have explored more recently is to be exempt from the AAT by meeting the education quality standards. But as soon as we started to pursue that, what it would mean for the Sharon Academy to meet EQS, we learned that doing so is not possible. This is because when the EQS were updated from the previous school quality standards, language was removed that allowed the standards to be applied to independent schools. Specifically, the current standards direct independent schools to statutory language that has since been repealed. So our understanding after consulting with the Vermont Independent Schools Association and the AOE is that an independent school cannot meet EQS. So without a way to set our tuition at, amount, at an amount that covers the actual cost of educating our students, TSA cannot equitably provide an education to all students in our area. We are forced to increase that fee, that tuition surcharge, which makes us less accessible to the families in our community, which erodes one of our major core values of being accessible to all students in our area. So the solution that we have come up with is statutory language that amends 16 VSA 824, stipulating that by meeting certain conditions, the Sharon Academy can set a tuition amount that is different from the AAT. I believe that you all have a copy of the suggested language, but I will um, quickly go through the, those conditions that would allow us to set a tuition different from the AAT. The conditions are open enrollment, which we already have, special education to all eligible students, which we are currently working towards, and two thirds or more of our tuition would have to come from school districts in Vermont. In other words, at least two thirds of our students would have to be publicly funded. By passing this amended language, TSA would meet many of the goals of the education quality standards and be able to set its tuition at a rate that adequately meets its operational costs without a surcharge to families. The last thing I wanna say is that TSA has no intention of becoming more expensive to taxpayers than other schools in our area. The goal is to deliver our mission to the students in our community, regardless of their ability to pay extra for it. So thank you very, very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you. I, I think it might help um, to get a perspective on how the, the funding works. So why don't we go to uh, Brad James from the Agency of Education to give us a foundation. Our committee has not had that foundational uh, understanding yet. So thank you, Brad, for helping us understand how, how we fund our... Well, <laughs> So, so uh, for the record, Brad James, Agency of Education, and um, I, I was sent a few questions that people asked me to respond to or to kind of outline, fill in. And I believe I believe that Jesse has those posted because I just sent too late again as usual. But the first <laughs> question, the first the first question is how are tuition rates set for approved independent schools? And and basically, independent schools set their own rate. Um, they can do whatever they so choose to do. Most of them do what exactly what Mary was saying is they, they go to the average announced tuition and um, that's that's what most of them do because we get lots of phone calls when the average announced tuition is, is published saying what is it if, if or what is it going to be published and that's when people tend to set their rates. So the vast, vast majority of approved independent schools in Vermont do set their rates at those, at those um, amounts. Um, the statute then sets limits on how much school districts can pay as a tuition rate to, uh, to an approved independent school. And approved independent school becomes a very long, wordy thing for me to say, so I'm just going to say independent school, meaning approved independent school. Um, there, there are different types of independent schools, but that's what I'm we're really talking about here. Approved independent schools are the independent schools in Vermont that public school districts can send public money to. Okay, they cannot send them to other independent schools such as recognized independent schools. So we're really just talking about the approved independent schools such as, such as um, Sharon Academy. Um, for elementary students, and I know this is really more a conversation with high school students, for elementary students though, statute says that uh, unless the voters choose to pay a higher amount, that, that the tuition is either the average amount of tuition for union elementary schools, tuition charged by the approved independent school itself, or the average tuition rate paid by that district for all of its elementary students. Generally speaking, it's the first one, the average amount of tuition. For high school students, um, again, this is, again, as Mary pointed out, section uh, 824C of, of uh, Title 16, the tuition will be at a rate no greater than the average announced tuition unless the voters approve a higher amount. Okay. So there, there's, that's, that's, where there is, and that's, that's where they are right now. So that kind of addresses how tuition rates are set for approved independent schools. The second question was for those approved independent schools charging different rates, please show a table with tuition rates and why they're able to charge higher rates when Sharon cannot. So the table's down below. I just want to address a few things first. First of all, to Sharon Academy can, uh, can charge whatever they want. Uh, there's, there are no limits on it. They're not required to charge the afternoon tuition unless their board says. Um, but they can, they can charge whatever they like. They have chosen to charge the average announced tuition, and I understand the reasons for that. But if Sharon Academy was charged higher tuition rate, then that cost, the difference between that cost, the higher rate, and the average announced tuition would fall on the parents sending the kids to the uh, to Sharon Academy. Um, if the a second thing they could do is. Um, the academy, the academy could ask the sending towns to approve a higher rate um, that has happened in other places or does occur in other places. I'll come to that in a second. Um, at which point, if they chose to do that and the voters approved it, especially a ward meeting for that or part of their town meeting with a specific article for it, then that would be the rate that people would do and they would vote on that annually. And so you could have a rate higher than the average amounts to it at that point. And lastly, the third choice that I can kind of really come up with here is the academy could pursue designation um, as, as the public high school for these sending towns. Um, I, Mary said there are 14 towns. I doubt if 14 towns would do that, but Sharon would conceivably do it because most of their kids need to go there, if I recall correctly. Um, but they could pursue designation if, 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 the, if the sending boards and the, academy, and the Sharon Academy board all agreed on designation, the voters approved it, then Sharon Academy would act as the public high school for um, whatever town designated that. And at that point, then they could get what they could set their tuition rate or whatever, and the district would pay that. So the chart at the bottom has the four, um, four approved independent schools, and they're really the historical academy. 
is the four big ones that, that used to act as public schools many years ago on um, certain areas. Uh, that they are the ones who are currently, to the best of my knowledge, are the only four who have a higher tuition rate than the average announced tuition. Why the first we, one is Bill Burton. Why don't we pull those up so folks can take a look at that? This is on, on your written testimony. Yes, um, it is. Yeah. Yes. I didn't know if people had it in front of them or not. So, yeah. And feel free to interrupt me anytime, folks, because yeah. I tend to go fast. So, um, let's see. Jesse, maybe you could bring that up. Yes, Chair Webb, I have that right here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And scroll down to the bottom, well, not almost to the bottom, to get to the table. Oops, but yeah, there it is. Thank you, Jesse. And so, what, what, what I have here are the four. <laughs> are, are the, are the four academies. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I have what their rates are for FY21 and FY22. Burn Burton is one of the, is, has the district, or not the district, pardon me, the independent school that has, that the voters in the surrounding towns who send most of their kids there have chosen and approved a higher tuition rate. Um, for FY21, that number is 17, 9,900 versus, I had to look it up because I didn't know it, uh, versus the average announced tuition of $16,233. So roughly a $1,700 increase over the average announced tuition. For FY22, the Burr Burton rate will be 18490 versus 16842 for average announced tuition. So roughly a, a $1,600 increase in round numbers. Okay. Um, that's, that's what the parents who are sending their, that's what the school districts who are sending most of their kids to Burr Burton are, um, pay. If a parent who is not one of those districts who's approved the higher rate uh, sends their child to Burr Burton, it costs them more. For 22, it's be $20,490. So basically what they're doing is they're charging more than the average announced tuition, but they're giving the towns who are sending most of their kids there both Linden Institute and St. Johnsbury Academy are able to charge a higher rate because uh, they together they act as a, uh, an area career technical center, CTE, regional technical center. And that's allowed by statute. And then Thetford Academy meets two different things for depending on who they are. They are a designated high school, public high school for Stratton and Thetford. So they, they those, those districts pay their the full tuition. And then they've also been deemed to meet education quality standards from years past rolling forward. Um, and, and so other districts that are sending in uh, their students, or the other parents who are sending their students those um, to the Thetford Academy, the districts are paying the full tu tuition to the Thetford Academy also. Questions on that chart? Um, I put... Yes. Uh, there, 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 you know, before, before I ask the question, hang on for a second, Madam Chair. There is a mistake. I thought I corrected it before I sent it to Jesse. I did not. On uh, Thetford Academy, at the very last, it says the statutory citation on the very bottom says 16 BSA um, has uh, sections 824 A and B. That should say 827 A and B. So, uh, just, just so people know. Why, why can... So, so Thetford meets one because it's designated. Yes. Um, and two, they meet the, the EQS that Sharon is not able to address. And, and how did that happen? Well, that's a good question. Um, and, and I was and I was I did I was unaware that um, that independent schools, according to what the EQS standards themselves say, which I have to admit I have never read, um, <laughs> are unable to to uh, meet meet them because the statute says that they can. That's that's section 165F. Um, so I'm not sure what the education quality standards say. It sounds like they're referencing old language that has been repealed. So I, I, but again, I don't know that. I'll, we'll have to check into that. But years ago, um, that when we had, it was, I guess, it was before, I'm trying to remember, it was before education quality standards or after. I think it was before. And I can't remember what we had before that because, again, this is not my world. That I, that I deal with. But um, the Thetford Academy met the, whatever standards there were, were in place at that time. It was, it was decided they met them. Um, and then I believe that as when they changed, and I'm pretty sure it's before the education quality standards, when they changed the education quality standards, just kind of rolled forward. And there's been some discussion about it. I, I 
I'm not sure where it all stands, but my there there's somewhere there's a letter saying that the Medicaid, and the reason I know this definitively is because the auditors, state auditors, were were looking at our tuitioning thing information, and they were diving into that deeply. Um, and so somewhere we have a letter saying that that Thetford Academy at is has been deemed to meet these education quality standards at this point. My understanding is it's going to be reviewed again later down the road. I don't know exactly when, because again, that's not the, the part of the AOE that I deal with. So just looking at Burn Burton, so Burn Burton, so Manchester, um, are, are they designated for Manchester? No, no, no Burn Burton does not want to be designated. Uh, um, they, but they, but they do. They basically tell the towns that if you choose to send most of your, if it, send most of your students to Burn Burton, and it's not just Manchester, it's some of the other towns around. I can't remember the whole list, but if you choose to send most of your students there, then we will give you a discounted rate. And every year on the ballot of those towns, there is a there is an article saying choose X number of dollars to pay, send your students to Burn Burton. So if I'm in a sending town and I want to send my uh, my child to Burn Burton and is is the, my child's access to that based on my town's agreement for what they're what they're paying or do I have to pay something extra it's yeah it's not the access per se it's how much it, it gets charged and who pays um if you are in manchester winhall one of those towns right around there and are sending your child um i think winhall is doing it still um then you would pay um for fy22 you would pay that eighteen thousand four hundred ninety dollars, and it wouldn't cost you as a parent anything out parent anything outside of your your, your pro education property tax okay it, that, it would be a public cost if you were in a town outside of that, say you were down in, I don't know, Halifax, um, and wanted to send your child up to, to Burn Burton, that's not one of the towns that has approved a higher rate to Burn Burton. So what Halifax would do is they would pay the average announced tuition, which is which about $16,800 for FY22. Mm -hmm. You as the parent would be paying that difference of roughly Roughly sixteen. Pardon me. I'm looking at the yeah. number. Roughly four thousand dollars. Yeah, thirty-eight hundred dollars, something like that. The difference between twenty thousand four hundred ninety and sixteen thousand eight hundred forty-two. And it just dawned on me it would have been nice if I put the average announced tuitions in that chart, but I didn't. Sorry. I just got a little bit mixed up on the math. I, I'm I, that, that, okay. So let, let, let me go a little more slowly then. Yeah. Okay. So, so you, you're you're there. There are two sets of towns here. We're talking about our school districts. Yeah. We're talking about one who one who has chosen to pay a higher rate to burn burden, and the other who is not. All right. So the first one, when they've chosen to pay the higher rate for FY22, um, they would be paying the town, the school district, pardon not the town, the school district would be paying that that tuition of eighteen thousand four hundred ninety dollars. Right. You you as a parent would pay nothing else. Right. Okay. That just be your your prop. You know, that just go to your education property tax rate. Okay. I'm from Halifax. Then I have to pay the difference between sixteen eight forty two and eighteen four nine. No, no, and and twenty thousand four hundred ninety. In, oh. in that, in that, in that, okay, it's, okay. it's not high there. I, I didn't yeah. put a dollar sign in front of it because I'm lazy. Yeah. Um, but, but for someone living in Halifax who's, who's, whose school district has not approved a higher tuition, then the rate is $20,490. I pulled this off their website. That's where I got the number from. And so you as a parent would be paying the difference between that $20,490 and the and the school district of Halifax would pay sixteen thousand eight hundred forty-two. You'd be paying that difference, so roughly thirty-six hundred dollars, somewhere in that range. Okay, thank you. Out of the pocket, <clears throat> plus your education property taxes. Yes. Okay. Um, other questions for Brad, Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. I don't know if we're going to get to this in a minute, um, but it seems to me that the core, core of the issue here is the average announced tuition rate. And so I wondered how that is set and whether it's an adequate number. 
I can tell you how it's set. I cannot address whether it's an adequate number because I don't really work in school districts. Um, but it, it is ba basically, it is a number that is calculated. It's in statute and state board rule. And it's based on actual costs of this, of the, um, uh, oh no, part, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one step ahead. Let me back up, ignore everything I just said, except for the fact that I don't know how it's done, or I do know how it's done. Um, it's based on, uh, pu public schools have to announce their tuition rate annually, okay? And when we collect that information, one of the things that is collected is for a union school district, regardless of the grades, we collect how much they're charging for grades uh, K through six, and how much they're charging for grades seven through 12, if they have a seven through 12 or nine through 12 or nine through 12 or seven, eight, if they're a K eight, whatever it happens to be. It's basically a divide between secondary and elementary, secondary being seven through 12. So what happens then is that the average announced tuition then takes those average announced tuitions for the union high school. So grades seven through 12, either seven and eight or nine through 12 or seven through 12. There's kind of grade ranges we look at or that they're out there and they just average it. And that's, that's what it comes out to be. It's, it's whatever they're charging at that point. Some union high schools charge a lot. Some high union high schools charge, don't charge a lot. So it comes out to you know, whatever the average happens to be. That's exactly what it is, an average. Okay, but that's not, um, all right. So the public schools all around the state announce their tuition rates and then that gets averaged. And then and only, and only for the union schools, only for the okay. union schools, right? So in other words, Burlington would not be part of this. Um, Springfield would not be part of this. Rowland City would not be part of this. A okay. union, a union school would be. Okay. And then do the, do public schools have to live within that rate? Well, these are public schools. Yeah, um, but I guess so, then are they held to it? No, they no. A public school can set whatever tuition rate it's going to be. There is a there is a um, a reconciliation down the road, which is what I was starting to talk about when I realized I was wrong, um, and we'll come, we can come to that shortly. But public schools, it just just like a, an independent board, comes up with whatever rate they think is necessary to educate their students, and they announce that, and then that's what that's what people are going to pay. So what you're looking at here is a subset of of all those. You know, um, of, of all those announced tuitions for all the public schools, you're looking at the unions and then a subset of that as, as the high schools themselves. And that's what the number is, that 16,000 plus number that we're talking about. So the- But, they, um, but they, they, they're, they're, they're not bound to that because what the law says, to, to, to really directly answer your question, what the law says is that a school district will pay the full tuition to a public school high school, elementary school, doesn't matter, but to a public school district in Vermont and out of state and out of the country for that matter. And then has a few other things in there too. So the, um, I'm sorry, I just, and then I'll move no, on. I okay. just wanted to make sure I'm understanding this. So the, uh, so the data that's gathered um, from public schools is used to set the average uh, announced tuition rate that, that public schools then, it's not like they are bound by that or have to adhere to it they can bring whatever budget to the voters they want to bring to the budget. But it becomes a very important number for independent schools. The, the budget and the tuition rate are two different things. Um, the, the budget is what people are going to end up paying. So if, if, you're, if you're in, um, I, I used Halifax. So if you're in Halifax and you're, you're, you're tuitioning your high school students out, whatever that tuition rate is that where the schools are going to, that becomes part of your budget. Um, and so, so in a place like Halifax, they may have people go, they may have students going to three or four different high schools, all of with all of public high schools, all of which have different, may have different tuition rates. And they may have some students going to independent schools, which then have more, more restrictions on what they get on, on how they're paid from the school district, but they can charge whatever they so choose. Um, Representative Austin Van Conlon. I don't have a question. Excuse me, not Austin, excuse me, Arison. <laughs> the other A. Um, Brad, why does the AOE choose to only use union schools uh, for the averaging? 
Um, and the reason I'm asking that is I'm looking at a list of all of our sending of uh, the schools that we send to in my district. And the only one on the list that's a union school is Green Mountain, which is a fairly small union school. Yeah. And all the others are almost two thousand, at least two thousand dollars more than Green Mountain. It, it almost looks like the the union school numbers are are skewed for some reason. The reason AOE does this, with all due respect, is because the legislature passed the law that told us this is how we do it. Um, it's been in place. I can give you a quick idea. I don't know how long it's been in place, but since I've been here, which is way too long sometimes. Um, hang on for a sec. Yeah, I'm looking at both the what when what I, I don't know the history of them, but both the elementary tuition and the high school tuition were first added to Title 16 in 1969. Um, what I'm sure they've been changed over the time, but I don't know where, how they've been because I haven't gone back and looked. But it's it's we, we do it this way because that's what statute tells us to do. Um, if you guys would like to change that, that's fine. It's it's you know we would just we would if we wanted to do something where we were looking at um, all public schools, then you would we would just collect that slightly differently. As a, well, we still collect it that way of, of grades secondary seven through twelve, and again whatever grade configuration that happens to be, and then the primary or the elementary grades down below. Um, it, it it can all be done. It's just we don't do it that way because that's not what the law says to do. Thank you. What is the impact um, on other uh, spending if if we were to change something to give them greater flexibility? If, sorry, I'm sorry, then Representative Conlon, I'm sorry. Do you, want, you go, why don't you go uh, first, Representative Conlon? Yeah, thanks. Brad, just a very quick question. Uh, when, they, when a school calculates its AAT, are there certain expenses that are not included in that? And I guess specifically, for example, transportation. Yes, yes, there are. Off the top of my head, I don't know what they are. Um, I can name some of them. I can look them up and find them fairly quickly. Um, they they take away transportation costs. Um, they take away that portion of costs that's provided by direct grants from state or federal sources, so like the titles and things like that for salaries and such. Uh, expenditures for maintenance, payments of principal interest for buildings, expenditures for special education, tuition payments for CTE students. So it, it, it takes that, some stuff away. Um, it's it's a um, it's not a, they they don't do the calculation. We do the calculation once we receive their actual information, um, and then we send that back out. And so right. it's a calculation done at the state level based on actual expenditure and revenue data coming in to us at the end of the year. And that's what they compare to what they announced the previous year that people paid. And that's where the reconciliation comes in if it's over 3% plus or minus. Right. So, so fair to say that when a school talks about its per pupil cost uh, at budget time and this, there's a reason why they're not the same. Yes, and, and, and also again, the, the average amount of tuition is an average. Um, right. So therefore, you know, people are higher, people are lower. Um, so, it, you know, some people right near it, some people aren't. Um, yeah, well, or even side. a school's announced, an individual union school's announced tuition is less yes. than its per pupil costs. Yes. Because yes. many of those expenses are backed out. So that's, that's right. So, so some people may want a lot of stu tuition students, so they'll give a good rate um, and then not worry about a reconciliation later. What, uh, if we were to make this adjustment that the Sharon Academy is asking, what are the implications for other independent schools and, and funding? For, for other independent schools, it would, it would depend on who met the qualifications that are, that are written. They, you know, it depends how specific they are and what other, what other independent, what other, uh, the other approved independent schools are doing. Um, I can't tell you without really knowing what they are. And then we'd have to go back in and look to see what's happening. Um, you know, so as 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 Mary said, that um, they're working towards providing uh, special education to all kids. They're not they're not there yet. How close they are, I don't know. That's a question for them. And I don't know where the other independent schools stand on that either. So some of the big ones probably are in the same place where they can do it. The special if, education, if, the cost of the sending district. Yes, it goes back to the cost of this, but they have to provide it. That's that's the thing. 
Um, so what would the implications be? The implications would be that uh, in the case of Burr and Burton, if they so chose, then they could all the school districts could pay that would pay the, the higher amount that individual parents pay from non approved or non voting sending districts uh, vote that that high, that twenty thousand four hundred ninety number. Um, it, it, basic basically, what it would mean is, regardless of what was charged, the, the school districts sending kids there would pay. That, that's a sense of what it means. What that would mean is that the, for those towns, when they set, when the tax rates are set, their, 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 their education tax rates on home sets would be higher. It could conceivably, depending on how much it changed, it, it could conceivably have a smaller impact on all the other towns in the state because it, it affects the ed fund. It's a greater demand on the ed fund, which could conceivably affect the yield. Usually there's enough wiggle room in there that, that probably, you know, we're not, probably not talking huge dollars here. Um, that that it wouldn't really affect the yield, but it has the potential to, which would might would minusculely not minusculely is not the right word, um, which would impact other districts, but probably not to a great extent. It would certainly impact. I'm, I'm just going to use Sharon as an example. The town of Sharon, the taxpayers in Sharon, if, because their their tax rates would go up because they're paying a higher tuition rate. So they could vote to pay more anyway, correct? If, if yes, they can. Sharon, Sharon could say, "We're we get it. We're going to pay. We we get it. We're going to yes pay more." They could vote that, but yes, I, I, imagine, I imagine that they don't. <laughs> Um, well, they haven't. I don't know if it's ever, ever been brought up or not. And again, I'm not. I'm not sure how many of the roughly 160 kids are from Sharon. Yeah. Um, my my guess is probably the majority, uh, but there are other towns around there too. So. Okay. Um, I just want to leave room for for Mary. Oh. <laughs> is it my turn yet? Yeah. Yeah. Can go, back. Can go back to you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well. Starting right there, I would say it's really important to remember that so many towns around here really enjoy uh, school choice. And so having students from coming from 14 different towns doesn't necessarily mean that all of those 14 different towns are gonna designate or agree on a um, tuition rate for the Sharon Academy because, because choice is important. And in the case of Thetford Academy, I would just want to clarify that Thetford currently, the town of Thetford is the only town that designates Thetford Academy as their designated high school. There was a very recent change in the town I live in to de-designate Thetford Academy. Um, it, I have to ask, is that Stratford? Yeah. Oh, you, you de-designated? Yep. I haven't heard that. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. good to know. <laughs> um, so I just, yeah, I just want to say a couple of a couple of additional things that um, to this idea that we can set our own tuition and it's just a matter of families paying the difference. That's exactly what's happening right now to the tune of seven hundred and fifty dollars for the high school annual fee, right? So we keep our tuition at the average denounced tuition, and then we tell every family that for every student they have, they need to pay this additional amount. And that's what I'm saying is becoming increasingly inequitable. And so in the case of Burr and Burton, that raises the, the tuition from 16,200 to 18,400, that's the amount extra the taxpayers are paying. And then um, additional, uh, this additional amount for the 20,000 rate that they, that they um, charge the families that do not live in that particular district. So I completely understand the ability to say that our tuition is higher than the AAT and put it on the families to pay. And I think that that is really inequitable. Um, I, I also wanna really recognize that the AAT is the problem and that was the first path we went down. <laughs> so Representative James, the question you asked, is exactly the question we asked and it seemed so big to try and move that needle that we took this other path, which is carving out space for the Sharon Academy to set its tuition. And lastly, um, and but then I would love, Andrew, if you have any thoughts to chime in because Andrew has done a tr tremendous amount of work on the AAT thinking. Um, but the last thing I would just wanna say is that um, the amount that we, are, that we are considering, if you think about the 750 dollar annual fee that our families are paying per kid. Um, what we imagine being a tuition that we could set that would make a significant difference in meeting our bottom line would be 18,500, for example. 
I just want to I just want to throw a number out there so that you have something to hold on to when you imagine what that would cost for our for our towns is a tuition of eighteen thousand five hundred. Andrew, will you speak to the things that you have been thinking about? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think a couple of things. Uh, Brad mentioned the idea of 165 F, and that actually is the place, the section of the statute that is repealed. So you actually, the educational quality standards say, hey, go over to 165 F, and 165 F is, if you look at the Vermont statutes online, which is where I'm looking, uh, it shows that section 165 F is repealed. So it makes it impossible for us to use that pathway. So I just want to clarify that one piece, because that's certainly, you know, for us, the educational quality standards would be a pathway forward. Also to know that in the example of Thetford Academy, right, um, they have lots of towns that come uh, that are not designating Thetford that go there and pay that tuition rate because they are deemed to meet the educational quality standards. So um, we're certainly not looking for you to change that for them at all. We're just looking to have a, a similar pathway uh, to be able to experience the, you know, the parity for students where we're not putting it on the backs of families to, to pay the tuition. Representative Conlon. Um, you know, I, th I think that kind of the big issue here is, is what you're asking for is to be able to set your tuition as does a public school, i.e. put it at a level that covers your expenses. Yeah. That's exactly right. But but without any of the public school accountability that goes along with it, such as a board, such as uh, audits, such as uh, public access to to what everybody has public access to with a public school. And, and I guess, you know, that's I think that's the challenge here is that you want all the benefits of being a public school. But without the the rest that comes with it, teacher licensing, um, you know, union salaries, all of that. And I guess I'd like to hear your response to that issue. I think that that is what, um, that, is, that is the thing that we were in pursuit of when we looked at the education quality standards because we are 100% open to figuring out if there are standards we can meet in order to have the same privilege as public schools. But we were cut off at the pass. And so I am more than happy to hear what standards an independent school that can set its own tuition should meet in order to have that privilege. Uh, Andrew, if you have anything to add, go for it. But I know that's, I think exactly right. I think for me, it's that, that if you look at the four, there are uh, currently in, in VSA, one, you know, 160, uh, 824, right? It talks about the idea that you can, an independent school uh, is allowed to set its own tuition if it has a, uh, tech center, as Brad mentioned, or if it uh, has a vote of the towns, uh, or if it has, uh, if it meets the educational quality standards. And uh, so there are these four schools that currently set their tuition above that and, and don't do, I think, what Representative Conlon is, is, is wishing for. And I'm not saying we're opposed to that either, Representative Conlon, but they don't do those things, right? And they're able to set that because they have that carve out um, for those different qualities that they exist in. And for us, I think the hope is, okay, let's, let's meet uh, the educational quality standards. Oh, well, we can't do that. Well, we're not large enough to have a tech center and we have students coming from all of these different towns. So the idea of having a vote, you know, it would be unfair to say, oh, the people who came from, from Stratford voted, but the people from Sharon didn't, the people from Tunbridge did, but the people from Chelsea didn't, the people from Rochester did, but the, you know, it just goes on and on. Okay, I'm going to um, just go to, to, to Brad James. We're going to have to pull this together fairly soon. Um, Brad James. I, yeah, I just want to go back to what you said, Andrew. Subsection F is not repealed in Title 165, either in the current law book nor online. I just looked. Um, subsection F, it says, in order to be designated independent school education quality standards, yada, yada. So we, we can talk offline on that, but it's, it's not repealed. You might be looking at something else, but currently that's not. Well, I'm just looking at it. It says E through G are repealed. F, F frog. Right. And if yeah. isn't isn't F in the middle of E and G? I'm not sure where you're looking because I'm not seeing that anywhere. 
we can do, we'll discuss it later. It's it's conversation, but there. So I'll get back in touch with the committee after you and I resolve it and let them know. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so that would be great if, 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 if we could get back to that. It's an interesting question for sure. And of course, what also begs the question is, have you considered going public? Which we've talked about before. Yeah. Well, I think the equivalent in my mind of that is, is meeting those educational quality standards, right? I think the intention when they were created was to, to honor the, the message of what it would be like to be a public school. And I, I think because we felt like that pathway was not available to us from the agency of education, that uh, this model would be the, the closest way of, of creating a parallel to that. Okay. I don't think we're gonna solve this problem at the moment, but the committee will continue to um, bring this up. Um, I'm happy to let you know when we do that. That's great. <clears throat> And I'm going to then shift us. I believe we have the next group coming in. We're going. We're uh, doing a, a mental gymnastics and switching back to S16, um, the task force on school uh, exclusionary discipline reform, exclusionary practices. So, um, and you are more than welcome to say, but I imagine you have other things to do, <laughs> and we appreciate your time. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I'm delighted to welcome back Wendy Geller, who is our data research director at the Agency of Education. And I see uh, uh, an assistant today. I do. Um, my husband had an immovable appointment, so this is our son, Sylvan. Well, um, the Education Committee, we, we love it. We have all sorts of things going on. We, we love it. <laughs> So say hi to House Education, buddy. <laughs> so so, so uh, we are looking at S16, uh, which hi. is great. Uh, thoughts about data and interested, since you are the data people, to uh, your response to S16. Thank you so much for inviting us here. I just wanted to, to say that first. Um, and uh, so for the record, my name is Dr. Wendy Geller. Uh, I am the division director for the data management and analysis division at uh, Vermont's Agency of Education. Uh, the folks that I have here with me today, uh, Sylvan notwithstanding, are uh, David Kelly, who is my research and stats section chief here in uh, DMAD, and also my colleague, Director Jessica Carolus. She is the division director for the student pathways division. Uh, she's very heavily involved in the equity work as well. Um, so we did submit some uh, some written uh, materials so that you will be able to refer back to those. All the links are live in those materials. Um, and so they will bring you to the, the documents and the uh, various different web pages that we've gathered for you there in, in these materials. Um, so we thought something that might be useful is uh, if we could walk you through some of the places where these data live at the moment um, on the web uh, and just kind of show you because we're conscious that um, folks just might not know where things live at the moment and where they can kind of readily go to get data. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit today about where we already report. Um, we're going to talk today a little bit about how we collect data. Um, we'll go over a little bit of the student data privacy law, FERPA, um, which is the federal law that we uh, have responsibilities under and have to meet obligations under. And then um, just at the end of the written remarks, there's a little table that I put together to, to provide some um, corrections and clarifications. I thought you, you might find that useful. And also kind of a list of uh, some of the federal places that we are required to report on an annual basis. Um, so this is a little bit of a tag team today between me and Dave. Um, Dave uh, is gonna, is gonna, we call it driving. Dave's gonna drive, so to speak, to walk you through the um, various different places if, if that works for everybody. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I figured we should start at the beginning of the data life cycle. So uh, what I mean by that is all the places uh, that we, that we um, showcase how we collect data. Um, so Dave, if you wouldn't mind just hopping into the knowledge base, um, we currently collect sure. discipline. Thanks, man. We collect uh, discipline data from all the public system. 
Oops, that's the VED. <laughs> why, why can't I? It's the next tab over. This bar. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. Knowledge base. Here we are. So and the method. All right. If you want to start. The sure. So the method that we uh, deploy at this moment to collect. Uh, discipline data from the public system is the EdFusion platform. Uh, you might know that as the SLDS, the State Longitudinal Data System. Uh, we follow all of the federal best practices when it comes to our required data collections, and this model uh, is actually borrowed from the FBI method of collecting incident data from local um, law enforcement agencies. So um, essentially what we're showing you here is our, our fully interactive uh, searchable knowledge base which we launched during the third quarter of last year. Uh, it's available on the, on the website. Uh, what Dave is showing to you right now is live. Um, yep. And so kind of like the last time when we talked together, oh gosh, that was other than the assessment testimony that was last year, wow. Um, you know, I think that folks talk to you a lot about ideas and we really wanted to show you some concrete, real live things at the moment. So we'll, we'll just be doing a little bit of a driving here. Um, so. What the knowledge base does is it, um, it explains our data collections. Uh, it certainly doesn't cover the entire body of data that the entire agency collects, but we have all of our most voluminous collections that DMAD manages here. And that includes the year end collection, it's called DCO4. Uh, and that collection is where the public system submits the discipline data. Um, so, Dave, if you just want to show folks where that is all readily available to them, so they know where to where to look sure. and where to find it. And all these links are in the the written testimony. Oh, great! The um, discipline data is here in across four tables using that method that Wendy uh, explained. That was based on FBI collecting information from local police um, agencies. So you have an incident, um, there's an action taken by the school. Each um, incident is gonna have an offender. Some incidents will also have victims. Um, not all do have victims, um, but some like harassment, for instance, are required to have victims. Um, the, if, whenever you get too deep, you can always go back, of course, uh, through typical navigation. Um, there's a lot of information in here and it gets very detailed. So if I was interested in um, say the actions that a school could take, I could go into the actual specification of actions. It will tell me um, what fields are being collected in that specification. It goes down to the column names. And as you see, there's a description and lots of um, technical information. Um, this is mainly intended for data managers that need to fill out that information for us. Um, there's also further up a, a tab that tells you um, what code sets um, are used for a particular um, uh, variable. Um, one of the relevant ones here is gonna be action type for exclusionary discipline, we're talking about um, a limited number of actions. Expulsion is one, obviously. Um, this does not occur very much in Vermont, um, so much so that I've never actually reported a non-suppressed number for expulsions here. So there are less than 10 each year in the state. Um, suspension and in school and suspension out of school. Um, those are being um, grouped together in the report that was the annual snapshot tool report that we'll show you in just a few minutes here. Um, both are considered exclusions. Um, obviously there is some difference. Um, the final one that's included, and this one also does not occur very frequently, is this unilateral removal to an alternative setting. Um, this is really um, in the case of a special education student that is gonna be removed from um, a public school long-term. And um, at that time, you, you 
put in place some interim um, services for that special education student under federal law and look for a, an appropriate long-term placement. Um, as I said, there are a lot of things in this uh, area. There are also um, FAQs um, in here. Um, these sort of highlight sort of the frequently asked questions that we get from data managers. How do they do um, different things? Um, you see that there is um, a, a question about suspensions and expulsions. There are some questions about unilateral removals. Um, just clicking quickly, you see it in suspensions and expulsions or exclusionary discipline includes both types of suspension um, is our answer to that particular question. Um, is there anything else, Wendy, that you wanted me to highlight from the knowledge base? It, it's just a general sort of encyclopedia of data collections. Yep. Um, the da discipline yep. data is only at the year end. Yep. Um, so I'm just conscious of our time and I wanna make sure we're able to show everybody like where the discipline data actually have been living on the, on the web for a while because I'm conscious thank that you. folks just might not know where it is. Yes, sure. thank you. Is that okay? Um, all righty, so um, I, just a quick word on the, um, the data standards because I did pick up on some of the drafted um, language about creating uh, data collections. Um, I, I think it's really important to just kind of let folks know that it's critical that we maintain our compliance with the federal government with regard to um, adopting their data standards and not creating our own. Um, there, there's a couple of really important reasons that folks might not know about why, why we need to, to maintain that. And that's because if we do not report as expected to the federal government and meet their definitions, we're gonna put the title funds at risk. Um, and the title funds are specifically targeted for all of our most vulnerable students um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I read this with, with view to thinking like, oh, this is a really important thing. You know, equity should be at the center of everything that we do. Um, but there are unintended consequences that folks just might not know about. So that's kind of how we need to, to hash through those pieces together. Um, so there are links to these again in the testimony, but you know, for example, if, if we were to kind of create our own data standards here in Vermont, we would jeopardize not just our access to the title funds, but our ability to leverage free federal resources, which are critical um, to the organization. So, you know, whether that is the open source community or the common education data standards, so we can have comparability across states so that we can compare our data to other states and see how we're doing and see how we're doing nationally, um, or whether that's actually entire reporting tools and platforms that the feds are going to expect us to move to in the next couple of years um, in order to meet our compliance reporting. Um, so it's really, really critical that we do not um, that we do not create our own standards here in Vermont, but that we adhere to best practices nationally um, in, in that regard. Now that's not to say that we couldn't co collect new data um, down the road, but there are costs associated with that. Um, and some of those costs, you know, I, I realized that we talked about this a while ago, but like costs are not just dollar costs, although there would be substantial development work on current and future infrastructure if we were to make adjustments. Um, but their time, you know, time and burden costs on the field to adjust their systems, time and burden costs here at the agency to adjust ours. So just to be aware of that. Um, so to leap forward to where the data already live on the web, um, Dave is going to drive again, and he's going to show you where the annual snapshot um, okay. is. And I'm just going to walk you through that a little bit. And Dave's also going to show you where all of those um, data are exportable um, on the web there via yep. the annual snapshot. So, all righty. Thanks, Dave. Can everybody so, see it? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, and wait one, one second. I'm sorry. I just noticed. Representative Austin, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you have a data point in terms of when a student is um, removed from a classroom due to the, his or her safety or and or the other the safety of other children. Um, the reason for removal. Right, that the reason they're removed is due to the, that student becoming hurt or and her or hurting uh, another student, other students. 
terms of the discipline data, there is an incident type that is a danger to oneself or others. Um, it, it, I don't know that that would cover every case that you're talking about, Representative Austin, because sometimes um, students are sent to a planning room for a period of time, and that, that, that may or may not be a disciplinary incident. If part of the planning room, going to the planning room to sort of de-escalate is part of either an IEP plan or an e uh, educational support team plan, that may not be recorded in this data. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the tool we're looking at um, is the annual snapshot. Again, uh, this is the Vermont tool for accountability um, from schools and LEAs around the state under the federal ESSA law. Um, the reason that the metrics that are in this um, display are here is they are part of the Vermont state plan, um, which is also uh, available. Um, to change the metrics that appear in this tool, we would have to also change that state plan. Um, you see up top, there are a number of different domains. The domain that we're gonna focus in on today is our safe and healthy schools. And the, the single measure that we have in here um, is the exclusionary discipline. Um, the overview for um, the annual snapshot uses a, a simplified version of um, sort of data um, uh, assessment of what was in the data. So it's kind of like a proficiency level grade at the um, state LEA and school level to say whether this um, entity is exceeding meeting or approaching or not meeting the standards that were set out in our state plan. Um, there's also always gonna be, when we have multiple years of data, a change score that you see. Um, and so that is just, are they declining? Are they excelling? Um, are they flat, flat lines? Are they the same? Um, and you see that there are two measures here we have both performance and we have an equity measure. Um, all of the measures in the annual snapshot have a, a, a sense of equity in mind. There are some trade-offs in equity when we deal with Vermont data that we're gonna get into later. But um, in general, I think you're familiar with this reason. It's one of the reasons that we group students together in um, sort of more generically um, subgroups at times is because those schools are small and we would not be able to display much data at all if it were not for that. If you switch over when you're in the snapshot to this um, tab that is exclusionary discipline, you'll see that you can start digging into the data in a lot of different grade ways. We, we have the ability to focus in on all grades, or we could say, you know, we know that discipline issues are highest in seven, eight, nine um, grades, um, and we could focus in on one of those grades. Um, there's also the ability to freely switch between the student groups that you um, are looking at in any one of these areas. The ones that have been uh, used here are you know, standard economic one for free and reduced lunch. I'm gonna come back to racial group in a minute, special education, English language learners, and I do historically uh, marginalized status um, last. Um, the racial group we've chosen here is not ideal, um, but given that Vermont has only 10% of its students being non-white students across the state, many of our schools would not have any data to present in the racial category if we didn't make this grouping. Um, it's, it's not ideal for those, it's, it, it's better for those schools. It's not ideal for a school where you do have actual racial diversity, like a, a Winooski school district or a Burlington. 
um, but it was chosen to maximize the amount of data that we could display. This last um, category is sort of a super group of the other ones um, combined. So if we consider that free and reduced lunch students, non-Caucasian, IEP, or English language learning students are at increased risk, we would place them in historically marginalized. And then the historically privileged is all those students that don't meet any of those criteria whatsoever. Um, that is um, a new sort of uh, grouping for us that came in under the ESSA law. Um, there's actually a button over here that I, I have to minimize all of you to see it. This could download what we've seen on our screen now. So what that might look like, we're looking at the state level. What you would get out of that download is an Excel sheet that gives us all of the different categorizations for the state by grade level, the numbers that are in there and the performance um, um, assessment that you've seen on the screen. It also gives a value um, for the um, numbers out there. Uh, these are a little bit more complicated. I didn't plan on getting into them today, yeah. but um, the annual snapshot tool itself contains extensive um, documentation. Um, here on, we have a user guide, we have an overview, we have different facts and glossaries. We also have and I think these might be the most convenient, the videos that kind of get into, um, you know, YouTubes are nice, not just for um, uh, students, but for us as well. So again, this um, comes out in a very easy to use, I think, Excel format. Um, you might um, only be interested in a particular grouping here, and so you can um, easily filter on it. It's a file that can be downloaded straight to your um, uh, computer. So you don't have to worry about altering any of our data. You're free to um, do your own analysis as you see fit. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions for just a minute. I'm also surprised to see you using the word Caucasian. I thought we were stopping, we stopped using that word, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Um, Representative James? And then, oh, sorry, yeah, Representative James and Austin. Thanks. Yeah, uh, just to make sure I'm understanding, when you say that it's declining, we're, we don't mean that the number of disciplinary exclusions are declining. We mean that we are declining in our progress of meeting the goals or the standards. Correct. <laughs> it, it's declining from the previous year for that particular entity. Declining. So in here. So for this cell that I'm on, uh, Representative James, this metric declined from the previous year for free and reduced lunch students in the fifth grade statewide. The incidents or the data or the, or the progress? The progress. The progress. And so, so just we're... a point of clarification before, before we kind of dive further. Um, yes. You mentioned uh, Caucasian representative web. Uh, yeah. These these are terms. They're they're code sets that we use at the federal level. So it, there's not a ton of um, there's not a ton of creativity, I suppose I should say, yeah. in how we write code. Um, so it it uh, for for what that's worth to to provide that as clarification. Yeah. Um, you know, we agree at the state level not to use that term, but uh, when you're writing software. Or you're trying to meet, you know, federal reporting requirements. Um, you 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 need to ensure that your code will run. Um, so the best way to to kind of give an analogy uh, about that is, so say you are trying to build a, um, say you're trying to, you have a model that you're trying to build, like a little model airplane or something, and it requires a certain type of a um, screw or a certain type of a, a fastener. Um, you don't really have a lot of choices about the types of screws and fasteners that you need to use to make sure that the, all the pieces will go together. Um, you need to use the screws and fasteners that the model calls for. Um, so I realize that's a little bit dry of an of a, of a example, but um, 
just to, to provide that clarification there. Um, and uh, so, so also, because Steve spends a lot of time with us, um, I just want to make sure folks know that you know, at the heart of the SSA plan was the commitment to equity. And that, that was a huge reason why we created the historically marginalized supergroup. Um, the, the, the big stumbling block that we have here in Vermont is our, our exceptionally, I mean, really unique, uh, and I use that word carefully, um, size conditions here in the state. You know, if we, if we, want to be able to report data on, on these types of events. We have to have a large enough size of events and students in order to report those data. Um, we can't breach students' privacy. Uh, we are beholden to the federal, to federal privacy law, FERPA, and we have a standard. It's, you know, and I have all this in the written testimony, so you can feel free to, you know, hop through it when, when it's convenient for you. Um, but it's, it's colloquially called the nosy neighbor standard. And that's the, it's essentially, um, you cannot release data such that someone who would be in the school community would be able to, with a reasonable uh, amount of certainty, know who those kids are by identifying them. Um, so just, just to be clear about that, and, and, and I think that we should be um, mindful that the historically marginalized group allows us to report data in a way that we would never be able to report if we were cross-tabulating them down to the specific um, subcategories, uh, which indeed we have to cross-tabulate down to those specific subcategories that you see um, already readily available there in the tool. Um, it's just that those data are gonna be suppressed um, to protect that privacy. So, yeah. so the historically marginalized group allows us to get at that. Yeah, the committee, the committee is definitely aware of, of that need given our small size and, and our numbers. I see a question. I also am going to need us to stop at 1215. So I also see that Jess is here. And I just want to make sure um, that we get to that and also want to make sure that uh, we know as we're looking at this bill, you just mentioned that there may be some problems in this related to federal uh, uh, requirements and would be wanting to get that specifically from you as we as we mark up this bill. Absolutely. Um, so we'll crack on here because we want to show you the other places where these data live that you can just readily get them um, okay. on the web. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about the equity indices um, and we've talked about the historically marginalized supergroup. Um, Dave, would you mind driving and showing them the um, the VED? Let me just quickly. Uh, Representative Austin, did you have a question? Yes. Um, my question is, and I think you kind of touched on it. I'm wondering if you could do different combinations, like you could look at free and, let's say you wanted to look at free and reduced lunch, Caucasian on an IEP in seventh grade, if that would be possible. And I'm a little, I'm curious about the marginalized group because even within that group, there's so many individual, individualized data points um, mm -hmm. that, you know, it's just, I'm just wondering how do you differentiate within the marginalized group, you know, to a, to really get specific in terms of, you know, a population. Sure. Um, oh, Dave, do you want to take that one or do you want me to go? I, I think that the specific, I, I think the specifics here are in more of the free and reduced, the individual subgroups for English language learners, IEP, the historically marginalized and privileged is really more to maximize what we can report. Um, you know, it, it, you don't know if the student has one of the criteria to be in historically marginalized or all four in this case. Um, we just know that there's at least one criteria for those students and the historically privileged students had none. So that, that's how the category is calculated. Is I'm there anything you want to add? Oh, sorry, I, I just wanted to, I think, because I think um, Representative Austin is getting at, um, we would, so from a, from a public reporting standpoint, our size conditions are too small to be able to publicly report data like what you're, what you're talking about. But that doesn't mean that the districts don't have access to it. Um, the districts have access to, to their data, so they could definitely dig into, into those pieces. It's just that we, we would breach 
the student's privacy if, if we were to, to um, cross tabulate and, and report that down because we're so small. Um, so does that help? That's what I wanted to know. Okay, doke, gotcha. Okay. Um, so we're just gonna leap ahead. I, I'm conscious about our time running out. Um, so we're gonna show you, Dave's gonna show you now the, um, the Vermont Education Dashboard or we call it the VED. Uh, this is live on the web. Uh, this is part of, um, remember last year how we were talking about modernization? Mm -hmm. um, so this is our new fully interactive, uh, fully exportable. You can download all the data that backs this up um, from the web. Uh, this is our new interactive reporting platform. We're decommissioning that old, um, you might've known it as the Reportal. It was an Oracle-based platform. So this represents, it's like about 15 years worth of a leap forward and technological advancement. Um, we, uh, we would love feedback. On this, we have a feedback survey on the landing page. I'm just gonna plug, like, give us some feedback if, if, if uh, you, you know, yeah, would, um. would find some time for that. Uh, we inform our future adjustments, um, our future development and new releases based on the feedback that we get uh, from, from users. Uh, obviously we use the, um, we have to meet basic reporting requirements that the agency has to meet. Uh, using this tool, uh, but we definitely would would love um, some feedback because we we uh, we use it and we we iterate through our our improvement processes. So, Dave, if you just want to show folks uh, how to use the VED, they can use it. You can use all of this today. Uh, sure. This is all um, live. Again, the, the the links are in the written testimony. Um, so, what I've done here is I selected the school year. Um, if there's not data available for a particular metric or uh, so we don't have 2021 data for incidents as of yet and you'll see that that turns up just blank um, incidents in this case are incidents of hazing harassment and bullying um, so um, hazing harassment and bullying reporting is a state requirement um, and it's not part of our accountability system. So the purpose and idea of the VED, and let's go back to a year that actually has real data in it, um, is to fill out some of the missing components from, there's lots of data that's important, not just what's in the accountability system. Um, and that's what this represents here. Um, you can see that, uh, even with this, there are cases like the hazing where there were no cases of hazing um, reported. Um, and statewide, there are very few cases of uh, hazing ever reported. Um, and it's almost always suppressed. We are looking to build out additional metrics on discipline data here. Um, Tom Ferris has approached the data team, and I believe he gave testimony on um, the directions that his team is going um, with uh, understanding discipline data more, and also, I believe, training the field in that area. Um, you can always, uh, this this second tab is nice because it gives all the definition that you can all, if you're done with Spalding, you can go back and look at all of the um, the schools, any of the other schools. In the tool itself, you can only look at one school at a time. Again, though, there is a, um, a, a dashboard, uh, sorry, not a dashboard, a um, place to download the entire data set. Um, and I think that one of the things that we can see quite quickly um, is if we go to school here, um, we have 21,000 rows associated with school level data. And if we were to completely just um, only look at the number that are suppressed from that, we get 14,000, um, and I'm sorry, this number is probably, it, almost 14,500 rows of data are suppressed because of the kind of number of students that you see in the grades here. Um, this, this means that two thirds of the data at that level get suppressed. Um, in a lot of ways, a more fruitful um, level to look at the data can be at this LEA level. 
um, or the SUSD level. Um, and again, one of the ways that we can use a data set like this is we can say, well, what I really want to know is I really want to know anybody that is a student group IEP and they're not meeting the standards. Um, and perhaps today I'm reviewing middle schools. So I'm just going to select grade seven and eight. And so we, we, we end up with a short list of, of, of districts. This um, feeds, these kind of um, annual snapshot data points feed into another process that we engage in at the agency, which is the internal field review. A monitoring team from the agency visits um, different SUs and um, supervisory districts each year. And they will dig through the actual files and interview people and um, get um, into the nitty gritty of these numbers. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop yep. and stop stop us for a minute because I'm conscious of the clock, yep. and um, we're getting pretty deeply into this, which is actually fascinating for people like Alicia yep. Representative Austin, who are you know just want to just go play with this. Um, yep. I also want to make sure that we're going to be getting the guidance that we need from you related to S16 to specifically get to that language and hoping that, um, so it, it's really fascinating to see how much data you actually do have and, and where it is. And I'm hoping that there's a cheat sheet somewhere that, that's coming. Um, yep. that's there. There's a number of cheat sheets. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm wondering if, if maybe we can bring this part to because I also want to make sure Jessica Carroll is in the room. Did you want to add something as well? Oh, um, yes. And Jess, I'll turn it over to you for the um, the data literacy pieces and the connection with 173 for the systems. Okay. Um, systems level approach. Because we, um, I, I want to let the, com the committee go and it just in yeah. five minutes. Can we, yeah. can we hang on for 10 more minutes, folks? Can we go yes. to 20? I, I know that, that so I, I'm going to take us till 1220 and let's see if we can, we can get to this, this Either that or come back this afternoon is the other option. So Yeah, I, it, I would just say, and for the record, I'm Jessica Carolus, uh, Division Director of Student Pathways at the Agency of Education. And, and Wendy has, Wendy and Dave have compiled that cheat sheet aligned to uh, specific areas within the bill so that you can crosswalk it. And, and I think just generally, you know, because this is such an important issue and, and the agency certainly supports the, the focus work of the task force, just that that tension, that balance between uh, transparency while also not wanting to put individual students at risk. So there is some language to around how the task force would compile data. And I think that's one of the things, you know, Wendy and Dave are trying to clarify is making sure that that's within um, a safe, uh, you know, and structured piece that's consistent with also the, the reporting requirements that the agency participates in. So I would just say too is, you know, not to offer my colleagues time, but you know, hey, I can do it. She's on mute. Is that even if if you know Wendy and Dave doing that walkthrough with members of the task force to just really sort of clarify, like this is that language, and then I I think we could certainly come back and say here here's where we make some minor modifications to the bill. We know that because of the move to remote learning, there have been increased incidents of cybersecurity attacks, particularly on school systems and state agencies. We know that. Act 89 report in commerce, you know, and there's been a, 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 a focus in state government and in increasing data protections. We don't want to inadvertently create uh, opportunities for students to be exposed unnecessarily. And I think that's the focus. So one of those initiatives too, as part of our implementation of 173 has been um, in providing this data literacy training statewide. I think we have 33 SUs, SDs who are participating so that we can make sure that there's appropriate collection at the local level that spins up to the state level so that we can report responsibly to address these issues that do exist, but in a way that is consistent, doesn't put at risk funding and doesn't put students at risk most importantly. Thank you. Committee. Any further questions? So, so Jess and, and Wendy and, and, and um, 
I lost your name. And David, you, you will be able to help us um, so that we make sure that we get the language right, that we don't actually do damage here. We don't like to do damage. And we don't like to lose money because of some way we put something, put, put you, you know, sending you down some, some bad road. Um, was this a question, Representative Austin? Yeah. I put it. I put it in the chat, but um, I and I'm. I, I'm assuming the answer is no. But is there any way to measure on and offline harassment and bullying outside of school that comes into school? You know, the behavior comes into school, but it occurs outside of school. Dave, I think you got that one. Yeah, I mean, so cyberbullying and harassment to us could still be a harassment or bullying incident. Um, each incident also asked if um, the internet or uh, a cyber means was used in, in, in the um, uh, doing the incident. That's not very good English, I'm sorry. Um, okay, thank you. Yes. And um, Representative Austin, uh, would, would um, David and Wendy, would you be available for uh, Representative Austin to check in with you directly? Because she's going to have for every qu question um, I have, she's going to have a thousand. Absolutely. <laughs> when it comes to data, she's our she's our champion. So absolutely, yeah. we would love sure. that. Yeah. And and anyone that's interested is free yeah. to follow up with us. It's really, it's, I think it's incredibly helpful to know the degree of data that you are taking. I know often when I'm looking for things, things aren't up to date, but it sounds like this area is. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, we in uh, DMAD have um, really prioritized the modernization work. Yeah. Uh, I know it was a long time ago when we talked about this, but um, we take very seriously our, our, our first goal in our strategic plan, which is the, the modernization of the systems. Um, and the decreasing the burden that it takes to maintain them um, so that we can be freed up to do more value added work for folks because there, there's a lot of data there and, and we really need to turn that data into information for, for, for folks. Yes, exactly. And we, we base a lot of good and bad decisions based on good and bad data. <laughs> should, should we mention the piece about independent schools not currently submitting discipline the, the independent schools are in the bill here and they don't currently submit discipline data to us and we would not be able to use the same mechanism of data collection for them because they don't submit the other components that public schools are re responsible for even our historic academies right even the historic academies we yep. consider them independent schools yeah yeah now that's <laughs> well, we can come back and, and get more into the like nitty gritty technical stuff too, if, if you folks would like. Okay, that sounds, that sounds great. Yeah, we're, we're going to be trying to, I'm, my hope is that we'll be able to move this bill next week. Okay. So, um, and um, Representative Brady is going to be helping us with that. So she may, may reach out to you too. Okay. Um, okay, everyone, I think that on that note, we will break. Uh, we have floor at the usual time. We will come back after floor and we will hear, I think, a little bit more. We'll hear from ACLU, I believe, yes. on exclusionary discipline. And we should by then have a tremendous amount of information that we're going to have to sort through and make some decisions. <laughs> um, and we will also be hearing from, where am I here? We'll also be hearing from um, our uh, Doug Hoffer, our auditor, on um, the current uh, report. And I think with that, if there aren't any other questions, um, we can go off.